All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your patience, folks. We just had to take care of some uh, technology um, things in the back. So welcome to this live Wednesday training. I am so delighted that you're with us today. And this is one of those webinars that I just really I'm excited about because I know that eventually we'll all need it, whether now or maybe in the near future. So. Anyway, our guest today, our, our featured expert today, is Mary Schlumberger. And before I turn over the, the presentation to Mary, I'd like to introduce her to you. Uh, Mary, is, uh, Mary is a native of, let's see, Pencil Pittsburgh. Yes. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right? Correct. And, and uh, Mary is the oldest of 11 children. She has five sisters and five brothers. And according to Mary, the girls won. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> so anyway, I want to um, maybe a fast forward it. In 1978, um, Mary and her husband started the business called Schlumberger Business Services and it grew. And so from that point, it became Schlumberger Accounting Services, which is a family-owned accounting practice, which has served the Citrus County community ever since. Yes. And um, Mary's parents passed away at ages 53 and 58. And Bob, her husband, Bob's father passed away at age 56. Kind of young, folks. But God had plans. And Mary began her caregiving experience by taking care of her she doesn't call her mother, her mother in law, her mother in law. She calls her mother in law her mother in love, and that's what I like for all of us to call our mother in laws. You know that we develop a good relationship that we call them our mother in love. So anyway, she took care of her mother in love, whom she got very close to, and it's it was a story of Ruth and Naomi, and she loved her mom in law, her mom in love, Mom Schlumberger. And she de uh, and Mary developed the patience, the skills, and the information that she needed to take the best possible care of Bob's mom. And it was God's way of preparing Mary for her call that he had. So several dear friends and a client also needed Mary's help. And so Mary spent a lot of time with them until their passing. And Mom Schlumberger went to, to her heavenly home in 2005. Anyway, fast forward to today. Today, Mary's dreams for her life are showered abundantly with, the guidance, with, abundantly with the guidance of the Lord, and she has been creating a fulfilling life that brings her great joy. Today, the title of the webinar is Surviving Your Senior Years, or, you know, Helping Your Parents Survive Their Senior Years, also known as Houston, We Have a Problem. And so I'm delighted to welcome today to our webinar Mary Schlumberger. Hi, Mary. How are you doing? Hi, Jackie. I'm doing fine, honey. Thank you very much. And uh, before we get started here, I first of all want to thank you, Jackie, for being a terrific coach uh, and to thank uh, Christian Experts for all of their great support and training. And um, also, I would like to open this uh, session of training with uh, a couple of scriptures. Um, there is a lot of reference in the Bible to elderly people. And um, one of those scriptures was from Leviticus in the Old Testament. And it said, you shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God, I am the Lord. And then in 1 Timothy, it talks about several aspects of aging when it talks about, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So, um, and uh, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father and younger men as brothers. So it is kind of talking about um, taking care of your parents and other people as well and uh, giving them wisdom and uh, benefit of uh, your care. So um, back in uh, scriptural times and in many cultures today, uh, it is a great honor for a family to take care of their elderly parents um, and or elderly loved ones. And um, 
it, it just naturally passes on throughout the family, uh, you know, from each person on to the next, from an aunt to a grandparent or uh, to the niece, and it passes on down. And um, if the family runs out of relatives, which sometimes happens, um, then usually someone that's near and dear to them, a close friend, will take care and take that responsibility. And um, I do consider it uh, an honor and a privilege to be with um, elderly people. Um, I have always been intrigued by their wisdom, their um, stories, and uh, all of the unique aspects of their lives. And I consider it a blessing that I'm a baby boomer myself and uh, because I kind of have been in the bridge between what our current uh, elderly population, the World War II generation, let's say the greatest generation, I kind of have been born between that bridge and what we have now as uh, the seniors, as us baby boomers are getting there really quickly. Um, so uh, it's nice because I have enough of memories of that time being young to share with them. And they really enjoy hearing uh, and hearing familiar songs and hearing familiar stories from their time. And they love to talk about it as well. So um, first of all, we're going to talk about the definition of survive or survival. And um, survive or survival has uh, a lot of uh, synonyms that, you know, you uh, endured and um, it, you uh, made it through. And uh, as we know in life, there are sometimes uh, rather difficult occasions so uh, the World War II people would say, I survived the Great Depression. That was a big change in their lives. It was something that was difficult to overcome. Um, also, the military, the veterans, and thank you to all the veterans out there um, who, who served our country and to protect us. And um, they also survived and overcame great hardship to still be alive at this point. And um, I don't know if they have uh, the uh, honor flight everywhere in the United States, but there is this wonderful program for those World War II veterans to get that uh, privilege to go to Washington, D.C. to see their memorial. It's a great honor for any veteran to do that. Um, and when we survive, sometimes we forget to live. That's a big word. And part of that word is in survive. But I've learned through the years that just to survive sometimes becomes a matter of not fully enjoying your life. Sometimes you feel so much like you are scrambling to hang on by a, a fingernail when you really need to take a look at a few little blessings in your life and start to live and to live with joy. So survival to me means really to live with joy. And in your senior years, your body's going to creak and, you know, make kind of noises and, and you're going to be aching and you're going to have to wear compression hose, some of us, unfortunately, and uh, orthopedic shoes. And we might need a little extra equipment, you know, to get us around. But other than that, we still have perhaps uh, our thoughts of being still a young person. And we still enjoy laughter, music, fun. Um, I don't consider that on the dying side of life. <laughs> I consider that uh, just staying, hanging in there and uh, staying with your life. And that means a lot of times you want to volunteer maybe, or maybe you have your church family. Um, who keep you at very active. Maybe you have grandchildren um, and people kind of ask you, uh, you know, do you have any grandchildren? Do you have uh, children? And that kind of uh, is an indication to them as to your age. <laughs> my, my grandmother never wanted anybody to know her age. <laughs> so up until close to her death, we all, all were not sure exactly how old she was. Um, but uh, it's uh, actually, I, I consider it uh, a joy that we've been able to live as long as we have. And I've known and been privileged to know my lifetime, many people in their hundreds and imagine the change they have gone through. When I look at the change that has happened in my life, just over these almost 60 years of life, 
um, you know, we had no computers. Uh, we were lucky if we had a television. And I just uh, was, you know, am really surprised at how the technology has changed and come to this point when we can actually talk to a person from Seattle, from Florida. <laughs> it's, it's come a very long way. So um, what can we expect when we age? Well, I would say uh, sometimes you can expect to have a very full and active life. Uh, there are a lot of people who genetically just their bloodline is like that. Uh, there's some very strong uh, Swedish and Norwegian stock. And uh, we know a lot of people from, <laughs> from Asia and the Orient and uh, Chinese people as well, dear friends that we have, who aged you you could never tell their age not ever and uh that's just the way god made us we're all different so some of us will be out some of the uh, senior citizens that i know are out golf golfing uh 60 holes of golf with their brother <laughs> just to stay alive and that's when they were in their 70s so uh unfortunately you know some of us are not so blessed quite as that and really, it's an, a matter of having a very strong uh, commitment to life, um, to uh, have a faith, um, and to have a belief that your life can be um, better. And uh, it doesn't take a lot to entertain some of us. And that kind of brings us into um, responsibilities, too, for living and responsibilities are not just about taking care of people but responsibilities are about yourself as a person and so as we age um, we have a responsibility to take a look at ourselves too because sometimes on those really creaky mornings before it rains we might feel like we're about 80 years old and we're not <laughs> And the 80 year olds that you know will tell you that you're not 80. <laughs> and in Florida, actually, you are not old until you're in your 90s. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're younger than that, you're not old at all. So, um, but we have a responsibility to try to live the best life that we can. And really, that begins by setting our attitude correctly um, and uh, trying to live our lives uh, with a full look at what we have set before us um, and maybe I always tell everybody that God put you here for a reason if you're not deceased yet then there's still something for you to do and your job is to figure out what it is <laughs> and I used to tell my mother-in-law that because she suffered from depression at times and I can imagine as people go through their lives and if they have a very debilitating illness it can be really difficult and they want to give up. But if they're still here, it wasn't their time yet. And God only is the only person that knows when that is. So our responsibility is to take care of our attitude because no one can fix that. I had to learn that the hard way with my mother-in-law. I thought, how can I make her happy? I did everything I knew to do for her, things that she loved to do thinking that would change her joy, and it didn't affect her at all. And it wasn't until she decided to take a hold of life that that changed the entire situation. And of course, when she passed on, we uh, celebrated her life at the end of her life. And it was a, a time of sadness as we lost her, but a time of great joy as well, knowing that her frame of mind was finally in a happy place. And uh, so we do we take that responsibility. We also have to take responsibility for ourselves to be wise, to try to choose a good lifestyle for ourselves um, and to try to take care of ourselves. Um, you know, now in this day and age, health has become a big issue and uh, people are starting to take a look at that once again. And so we are hoping that that's going to uh, you know, go keep going in that direction. And uh, as you know, with the medical uh, advances, people are living longer lives. We aren't exposed to as many harmful substances as our grandparents and great-grandparents were. 
they had uh, bad living environments. They maybe didn't have enough of food or not the right food to eat. So longevity is really an amazing thing now when you consider the age my parents died at and my great great grandparents before that uh, some of them died at very young ages and maybe from a tragedy at work uh, they didn't have things like OSHA in the old days to watch over people's safety in the in the mills in Pittsburgh especially and uh, so you know this is one of those things we all have to look out for each other but also look out for where our hearts are are our hearts in the right place maybe we need to go and find out and ask a question. Maybe you have a really good friend who you don't know why you really love that friend, but there's something about him. You maybe ought to ask him what it is because you might find out that <laughs> that they have this, this joy in their heart because of their Savior. And we really ask that you just think that over. And even if you're not ready to make that decision yet, your friends will be praying for you anyway. Also, we wanted to talk about there are certain types of forms as you start to age and because I'm getting there myself, there are certain types of forms that make your life easier, but also make it easier for the people who will have to take care of you perhaps in your later life. First of all, the forms that you need, and that would be that I need, that people in their 20s need and 30s, and I made up forms for myself unfortunately because I do have many health issues and have had many accidents and and issues that have created great uh, problems for me so when I would go to the doctor's office to fill out paperwork I would be sitting there for two hours just to fill the paper out so now I've put everything in computer and if you don't have a computer take it to your nearest trusted professional or find a secretary or something to can type it up for you. But I've typed up, first of all and foremost, a medication list. The medication list is really important because no one knows what you're taking but you. And in a lot of situations, even you may not know what you're taking or why you are taking that medication. So this medication list would be the list of the name of the medication. And sometimes it has a generic name and a um, well-known name or the original drug that was made for that purpose. You will have a dosage amount. That means how much uh, of the medicine is in each pill or capsule. You would also have um, a list of how many times you have to take it. And do you take it before bed or do you take it in the morning? You want to list all of that. And then also to list what you know to be the reason you're taking that medication and what doctor is prescribing that medication for you currently. Um, and if you know when you began taking it, that is also such helpful information. And if you make the medication list, what I've done is broken down the medication list into the daily medications that I take. And that would include if you're on aspirin therapy or anything like that, that the doctor has asked you to start um, even if it's something that's over the counter now, but was prescription prior. If you have to take it every day, put it in that category. And then I have a list of medicines that you take as you need them. So perhaps you are like me and have asthma. Um, you would have medications that you may not have to take every day, but you would need them if you get sick. So you would list those in that category. Or if you have a... Um, uh, um, something for coughing or something that you cannot sleep well. Asthmatics have a lot of difficulty with that because a lot of times you're coughing. So that would be an as needed medication. Also, the next category would be vitamins and supplements. And I have those listed as well. And that's so important. Many years ago when vit vitamins became so very popular, people were taking all kinds of vitamins and herbal supplements. And they didn't realize that some of those herbs and supplements have conflicts with their medication. And so now a lot of doctors, excuse me, <clears throat> a lot of doctors will ask you, <laughs> excuse me, I need a little water. Hold on. <clears throat> they will ask you what you're taking or they will ask you to 
bag up all of your medication and your vitamins. And if your medicine bag is like mine, that's a lot of stuff to take to the doctors with you. Not to mention you're kind of afraid you're going to lose one on the way. So what I would suggest is just to write it all down there and make sure when you look at your vitamins, if you take a certain brand of vitamins, you know, you could say, oh, I take this brand or that brand of women's vitamins over 50. Um, I take an eye vitamin or I take, uh, you know, extra vitamin D or C. Now, in cases with vitamin D and E and things like that, sometimes your doctor has prescribed you to take that or supplements like magnesium they prescribe you because if you have low magnesium. So write that down under there. Give them a little idea of why you're taking that specific item or supplement. So my medicine list is as complete as it can be. At the beginning of it, just put your name, your phone number, your address and everything. And then when I go into a doctor's office and now because of the new um, health care law, the doctors have to give you a sheet every time you come to the office and ask, how are you doing? Has there been a change in your medication? I just give them my medicine list. I give them their little form, signed and dated, and I'm done. So, you know, like a little bit of time spent at home can save you much time in the doctor's office. And sometimes when we're going to the doctor, we get nervous and we end up um, forgetting what we're on. And sometimes you can't spell it. And if you don't have the bottle in front of you, you don't know what it is. And there's many medications that are spelled a lot alike. So do yourself a favor and get that all lined up at home for yourself. And if you take that with you, that's great. Then the next one they always ask you is, how many hospitalizations or surgeries have you had? Well, I can tell you it's pretty difficult to get a 95-year-old to remember what hospitals they were in and when what year did they have surgery well they might have scars on their body that indicates they had surgery but they don't remember what they had so do yourself a favor and write that down and just make yourself a list of what you had and if you don't know the exact date rough in the year is to the best of your knowledge you do the best job you can and that way that takes care of another part of their list that they like to give you and questions they want to ask you. <laughs> so you have that all written down and you're ready to go. The next important one is your medical condition list. And the medical condition list is you list what you have. Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have asthma? Do you have uh, diabetes? Do you have cancer? Things like that. You write all of those things down and um, that gives the doctor a good indication of what's going on with you currently, what you're being treated for at that time. Now, they will ask you on their uh, applications for, have you ever had this condition? But on my medical condition list, I list just what I currently have. Um, the other thing is, is the very other very important one is a doctor contact list because your general practitioner may send you to several specialists, like I have a pulmonary for asthma. So they may send you to the pulmonary. Or let's say you have a bad knee or you had to have your hip replaced. You have an orthopedic doctor. You have so many different doctors in this day and age to go to that if you have that contact list with their names, phone numbers, and uh, maybe when you began seeing them, or when is your next visit due with them? You know, some doctors you see once a year, other ones are much more often. So everything you can list down is really a help for not only the doctors and nurses who take care of you, but also for if you have to have surgery for the anesthesiologist. They love that when you know why you're taking a certain medication because they know what's going to interact with that. Um, and also for your family for your friends. If your friend came uh, because they heard you screaming and you had fallen and broken your hip, they don't have a clue what normally every day you take. And at least if they can get a screaming answer from you as like, did you take your morning medicine? Yes! Then they can at least tell the ambulance driver what's going on. So these lists are very simple to do 
and it just gives you so much less headache when you get to the doctors to fill out the paperwork. Now those papers are really informational and family medical history is the final one. If you are um, old enough to remember your parents um, and grandparents probably, um, depending on if they had a very catastrophic illness like cancer, um, or in my case, like my parents died at a young age, I have listed what they died from. And uh, we know that some of their situations, perhaps environment caused those issues, but it's very important to have that family medical history. And my baby sister ended up having a stroke at the age of 39. And my one of my younger brothers, who was in his 30s, ended up having an aneurysm both of them, it occurred after they had taken a flight. Well, what happened is they were both very healthy, very active in their life. They ate right. They took good care of themselves. And probably if it had not been for that, they may not have survived those incidences. But it turned out where my baby sister not only had the stroke, but she, and they ended up finding a congenital heart defect with two holes in her heart they were able to go in and fix it uh, shortly after her stroke. And she is now doing very well. And my brother with the aneurysm came through that. He has some residuals from that, but not a lot. But still, we know, have found out because of this situation and a nephew who ended up throwing a clot to his lung after leg surgery, we know that in our family there is some uh, difficulty with our blood. There's something in our blood in our family line that can create a clot um, or can cause you to uh, bleed, you know, over that. Like you think uh, if you have varicose veins, well, how can you have a stroke if all those lumps of varicose veins are in your legs? Well, sometimes that's what happened. One of those goes and can get to your brain or your heart. So, um, or you do get an aneurysm that forms things like that. But um, it's very important to know that medical history, and especially for the younger ones in your family. And as I told, told you, my younger sister, she was in her teens when my parents died. So she had no idea. And because she could not talk after the stroke, her husband called me and asked me to come down to talk to her doctor about the family medical history. And it was so very important to have. So please do that and share it with your family. Share it with your siblings, with your relatives, so that they know in the direct bloodline what's happening with you. Um, this is really important information to have. The next thing we're going to move on to is um, there are forms that people will need to take care of you. And it varies by state. In Florida here, we have what's called um, a living will. And uh, some states call it an advanced directive. When you go to your doctor's office or hospital, they may ask you for that. Um, that's kind of a standard form these days, and it expresses your wishes at the end of life or should an emergency happen. Um, the other thing is, is that um, you would also have a medical surrogacy form, perhaps, because let's say you're going under surgery, you're going to be under heavy medication afterwards, and whoever's going to be taking care of you at that point um, the hospital may come in and want you to sign papers while you're under medication. And who's going to be responsible for that when you didn't even realize what you were signing? Uh, you know, if your uh, family member's taking care of you, um, they should have that as well, that form. And it can be for a short time that you have this form done. Also, um, it's important because they can talk to your doctors for you. They can also make health decisions for you if you are in a very severe situation. But it is important to have it. And some states combine it with other forms. So you just have to uh, check with an attorney in your particular state for those type of forms. The other one that your hospital will ask you is, do you have a durable power of attorney? Now, some states call the medical surrogate form as a durable power of attorney for health. Um, other ones, you know, just do medical surrogacy, but the durable power of attorney that we have in Florida, 
um, can be broken into those two areas, but instead we usually do medical surrogacy and the durable power of attorney, which covers all of the financial issues and things like that. That's something that your family or your trusted friend or professional is going to need if they have to take care of you. I've had some clients that have asked me to please make out their bills for them because they were losing the capability to do that. If they could still sign them, they would do that also. But it's important that you have a legal piece of paper to do that. Now, sometimes um, you want to consult with uh, several different people in your life. And I want to uh, put a disclaimer in this section of the webinar, and it will also be in my ebooks. And that is that I am not an attorney. I do not give you legal advice. I'm only sharing with you my experiences from what I've had to go through and have with me when I take care of people. So I want you to understand that it's very important for you as an individual to go and find the best professional in your area to take care of your needs. And don't be afraid to go check a few of them out and check out their uh, reputation. Talk to some of your friends. Who did you go to? Who do you like? Um, and some attorneys specialize in elder care. You can look for some of those. They are very good at that. Um, the other thing is, is in your doctors, when you're going to a doctor, you know, look for a doctor that makes you feel comfortable. And don't be afraid to change a doctor if you're not real comfortable with them. It Give them a little time, though, because sometimes when you have to change something critical like a doctor or an attorney or an accountant, uh, it's really hard. It's like changing your hairdresser. You know how much stress we go through when we have to do that. And it's even worse if you have to change a dentist. But, you know, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's very difficult. But there are a lot of trustworthy people out there. And there are a lot of professionals that I know that have the utmost care for people that are getting in their senior years and they want to do right by them and they want to make sure that they are handled well, taken care of, that they, they don't take advantage of them. And we caution our clients all the time about being careful. Be careful who you trust. They may look trustworthy, they may sound trustworthy, but in some cases, unfortunately, as I had read in a book before we moved to Florida, there are many kinds of insects in Florida and they're not all in the insect species. Some of them are in the human species. <laughs> so <laughs> be careful who you choose. <laughs> so, but you really need to trust a professional in order to uh, have some of these forms prepared. Although, as I said, the lists of your medical history, medications, etc., those are all forms that are very simple to do and you can do on your own. And um, I will have that as uh, what we consider a love bomb. <laughs> I will have some sample forms <laughs> ready for you in about a week. And uh, if you want to sign up to receive that, uh, I'm sure Jackie will explain <laughs> how to do that at this point. But uh, we uh, you know, are more than happy to provide anything that helps you to help yourself and also to assist those who maybe have to care for you. In the future. Um, also, I wanted to talk about um, a little bit of <laughs> just about aging in general. And uh, I know myself, I had written myself a little note about, I guess I'm becoming a senior citizen since this year I turned 60. <laughs> and um, I think I need a little help. <laughs> But uh, if people ask you, you know, um, you know, how do you know when you have become a senior citizen? Well, maybe AARP has you on their mailing list. Well, I don't know about you, but they started to send cards when I was in my 20s. Same so, here. Yeah, so that's not always a good indication. <laughs> and uh, is it when uh, you get the discount at your favorite department store for being over 50? Now that one's a pretty cool one. Although I have to say the first time they offered it to me and I wasn't 50, I was very insulted. And I told them I would not take it because I am not over 50. My husband told me that wasn't a good choice. 
<laughs> and then also sometimes, uh, you know, you, you think of uh, people when they become a senior citizen and probably when you think back about your parents, um, you think about, oh my goodness, my grandmother, you know, she looked uh, very, very aged at that point. And uh, she may have only been in her 40s or 50s uh, or 60 even. And I remember my one great uncle in, in example, he uh, looked old to us because of course he had early balding that was a genetic thing in the family. And we asked him how old he was. Well, the one year for his birthday, he told us he was 64. We absolutely believed him without question. He was only 46. <laughs> so, so it's very confusing when you try to figure out who is their age. <laughs> the only thing I can tell you is that sun damage will age you a lot faster though. And then also, um, you know, how do you feel if you don't feel your age? As I said, I've known many people in their hundreds and they are so sharp. Uh, they've been blessed with still a very good cognition and uh, been able to still read their the scriptures or read their favorite books to stay engaged to play cards or, you know, uh, they keep their brains going. And that's really important. They also um, say that um, now sometimes, you know, um, you end up having a conversation with your friends or family and you all, all of a sudden notice that you can't quite hear what they're saying and you start going, what? Huh? Huh? Well, that might be an indication that you might need to go have a hearing test. Now, if you're like me, my last hearing test was in high school. So <laughs> it's probably time for a new hearing test at this point. And don't be embarrassed because we all need tools. Our computers are tools at work. We have pencils, papers, calculators, etc. And these are just tools. And hearing aids these days, they've made them almost invisible. So you really have to look hard to see if anybody's wearing them. Because when my husband doesn't hear me, I check his ears. <laughs> anyway, but uh, the other thing is, perhaps you've been living through a lot of ups and downs and you kind of feel beat up. Um, just hang in there. You know, the Lord's got plans for your life because, as I said before, you're still here. And you've got a lot more time ahead of you. Um, and if you don't have a lot more time ahead of you, God's going to let you know that because you'll be gone. But we just ask you to do the best job you can in hanging in there. And if you're feeling sad, find somebody that picks you up and lifts you up. Somebody that makes you laugh. Call a friend and say, hey, can, can we go to lunch today? And the other thing is your body changes. And they have special education programs for people like us that are over 55 for driving. And that's a really important thing. Um, take that course that will help you to understand the changes your body has gone through and uh, or will go through and to adjust your driving habits to accommodate those issues. And the smartest people, we have some clients that are still driving in their 90s and it is frightening. I have to tell you, when we see them come, we ask them who brought you today. They said, I drove. And we're, oh, but anyway, <laughs> the whole thing is, is that some of the, the clients are very active and very capable drivers. They've never had an accident. One of the indications though, that you're having difficulty is if you do start to have some fender benders. And the, the, the smartest seniors that I know do not drive at night. Um, and they stay within their radius of their home. So please, you know, just be very safe about that as best you can. And uh, hopefully you'll drive long enough that it's going to be uh, a good situation for you. So I'm checking the time, Jackie, and I don't want to overrun our time. I don't know how much more time we have left. Um, well, we started late, so I think we can go just maybe about 10 minutes over the okay. hour. All righty, very good. All right, so um, I don't know what most of you did during your, your active part of your lives in your teens and uh, 20s and heading on up to the years where you are now, but it's really interesting for you to kind of jot that down somewhere just in case you 
forget about it, you know, at times. Um, and what I would say is uh, maybe you raised your right hand and, and swore an oath to defend the country. And there's a lot of people my age and younger that have done that since 9-11. And also, as we know, our greatest generation and the ones who went before them, all throughout the years, we've had these wonderful, brave, courageous men and women who have protected this country. And we owe them a great debt of gratitude and also a great debt of patience and support. Um, there are so many of the veterans who are homeless. Please keep them in your prayers. It, it's a very difficult situation for them. Um, you can imagine uh, living in a certain situation and having to come home from the battlefield and try to fit back into life. That's not always an easy thing. So maybe you think someone you see just hanging around on the street is a bum or something. And that's not always the case. Sometimes they are ill. Sometimes they suffer the effects of war and the wars never ended for them. So please take another look. And if you see someone that needs help, sometimes that's God. He has put that person in your path that day for a specific reason. And it's whether you have an extra bottle of water in your car. And in Florida, that's very important. It's so hot here. You have an extra bottle of water and you're in your car. And I can't tell you how many days that the Lord has done that. And I've even run behind time trying to get to the appointment I have to do or whatever. And it was for a specific reason because God had this person on this street that needed that water or a meal or something. So, you know, just always think about that. Take a look around your surroundings because there are all kinds of opportunities to help and to help in very small ways, but be safe as well. And also um, when you think about what you did in your life, Sometimes when you get feeling really down and you feel like you're, you're, you haven't done anything interesting since you retired, take a look at what you did from the beginning. Because I can tell you by getting this webinar ready and starting to do my book and writing the biography of what has transpired in my years of life, it, it is amazing how many times you move. My great aunt told me, do you know how many pieces of paper I've had to tear out of the address book because you have moved five times in three years? <laughs> so it's it's really tough. But, you know, the thing is, is that maybe you've had so many different jobs. Now, sometimes in years past, it used to be in, in the industrial age where people had a job for life and they they worked at that job from the time they were out of school up through retirement age. That's not happening these days quite as often. And so you may have worked many different uh, areas and maybe you worked in some areas that you really enjoyed. Like for me, I love flowers and plants and I've been fortunate to have, have uh, been a floral designer in the past and um, I still love it to this day and I get to do my hobbies once in a while. Maybe you like photography and maybe you didn't have the... Um, wherewithal to have a camera when you were younger and it opens up a whole new world to you but maybe now you in retirement maybe you've got a few extra dollars that and you don't know what to do you kind of are looking for a hobby well you know there's so many hobbies to do that are within reason and um, also a lot of volunteer activities are available for you to help with a lot of the schools need mentors for their kids um, because there's a lot of absentee parents. So take a look out there. There's a lot of opportunities for you to do. And maybe something that you did as a job can be a blessing to someone else. Because God, I believe God doesn't do anything by happenstance or accident. God has a plan. And so if you've gone through an experience, whether it be a really good experience or a really bad experience, God is going to use that in your life to touch someone else's life. And I was a directory assistance operator for Bell Telephone when I was out of high school. And my last client that I took care of was an Alzheimer client. And she was a telephone, worked for Bell Telephone in the eastern part of the United States for 40 years. She started out as an operator out of school. 
and she worked her way up in the company until she became what they considered an engineer. And she had to calculate by hand with no computers. She had to calculate the traffic flow of phone calls to 27 different telephone offices in the area that was covered by her company. And that is a phenomenal job. I, you know, I just think that's so phenomenal. But how did God know that I was going to meet her and be able to share that in common with her? I didn't know. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you do in your life that you think are just mere little, you know, uh, situations or it's a short term thing or it was just a summer job or whatever. But it really has a lot to do with what's coming up next. And um, so in our office where I needed office skills and I didn't have the opportunity to go to college, but I was able to work for the guidance office in school in a youth summer youth program. And I really feel sad. They don't have a lot of that anymore. And it's difficult because in the situation I was with all of those siblings, I needed a job and I was looking for that. So I went through business classes and I learned some of my skills working in the summer youth program. And I really came to enjoy it. And it's, and it's been a blessing to me ever since, um, as you know, because I work with my husband and have been working with him uh, in this August will be 38 years. So I just, you know, it just amazed at how every little thing comes together. Also, um, maybe you uh, did something like uh, you were a cashier. Uh, you know, maybe you worked for a little department store that's no longer in business. Um, that's a great history story. That's maybe a history of your area, what happened there. Maybe you were an apprentice for a plumber, plumber or a carpenter things like that. Those are so intriguing. And that's something that you can work with well into your senior years. You can work with wood or you can teach someone else how to work with wood. There's a lot of young people around here these days that don't think they're worth anything. They don't think they have any skill. Part of it's because they've been sucked in immensely by technology and it, com and it completely consumes their life. So maybe you as a carpenter uh, can teach them something uh, simple to do, to let them do an art. And a lot of our schools are getting rid of arts, they're getting rid of music, but those are very strategic and so important to a child's education. It gives them something that they can be good at, that they can excel at, and uh, it makes them feel better about themselves because during those, those middle school and high school years, a lot of young people feel terrible about themselves and they feel like they absolutely have nothing to offer to this country. But I'm telling you what, those are the people that will be taking care of us as we age. So if you get a chance to, you know, make an impact on their life, do it. It's, it, it will come back to re, you know, really uh, help out a lot of people. So I really encourage you to do that. So, um, so Mary. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you would like to transition to some of the questions that we uh, we might have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, <clears throat> um, first of all, I wanted to let you know that you've been getting so many compliments. Your cousin, Kathy, or cousin B, says hello and that you're doing a great job. Thanks. And then, of course, Robert says, Marianne and Diana say you're doing great. <laughs> and Robert, is, is, is he your husband? He's on, on the webinar. Oh, great. Love that. <laughs> So you're getting so many compliments, and Diana says you're very interesting, and uh, Jennifer says that you're doing, she says, go mom. So <laughs> we have a lot of cheerleaders in, over here. So I wanted to move into some of the questions. One of the questions that I, well, maybe a couple of them, if you don't mind. Sure. Is, um, you, you spoke about somebody that you know who has all, Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. and um, can you maybe share briefly how you can prepare the the caregivers, the family, the relatives of those who are experiencing symptoms are of dementia or Alzheimer's, how do you prepare the family emotionally, mentally, relationally, because they see their loved one, their loved one, uh, you know, having the symptoms of dementia or Alzheimer's, Mary? Yes, it's really, um, 
A difficult disease, I would say, for the families. Um, I did have another occasion after my last Alzheimer client passed to counsel another um, uh, client on uh, her husband's Alzheimer's. And the difficulties are knowing what to do for them when. Um, the disease is ever changing and constantly changing in the degree of care that you have to give them. And um, so as each uh, level or stage they go through, the type of care or the amount of care that they need is going to be different each time. So um, whenever I talk to a family, or in this case, it was the spouse of an Alzheimer client, um, it, I just explained to her not to fret because most of the people that have a loved one that is given that diagnosis, it almost has become the new cancer, so to speak. Years ago when people used to say, oh, your loved one has cancer, that, it was like a death sentence. Well, now, as we know, medicine has helped us to survive through cancers and they are working on dementia as well. And dementia is really the disease. Alzheimer is a form of it. And you don't always know if they have the same type. They all vary. And there are tests that they can do to specify and, and uh, hone it down. So if you see the person starting to have symptoms, uh, you can try to mention to them, hey, um, you know, or ask them a few questions. Usually what happens in dementia, they start to lose their short-term memory first. And so, uh, but they'll remember what they did 60 or 70 years ago, like it was yesterday, you know. And you'll begin to notice that they forget how to do common things. Like they're not really sure why they should brush their teeth or what the toothbrush is for. And um, those are more functional things. So that's really, you know, with the family, you look for those signs, you try not to dwell on it too much because you don't want to make them nervous. Um, but if you start to see some things happening, you know, you know, I would say even if you don't want to alarm your loved one in having them think they've got dementia, um, that you would go and speak to the doctor yourself and ask for some helps. They can give you some uh, literature on the disease and also give you some helpful information that way as well. But it really, I I'll tell you what comes down to is that uh, somebody with dementia can spot a fraud a mile away. There may be parts of their brain that are gone, but I'm telling you, if you look them in the eye, they're going to know if you're lying or you don't really care. So <laughs> if, if you're not the caregiving type, <laughs> kind of, you know, <laughs> let someone else do it. That can really help them. But yeah, wow. just love them. That's so, fantastic. Yeah. Wow, that's an excellent, excellent answer, and I really love how you address the, the different, the different um, aspects of it—not just emotionally, relationally, but also medically. You can talk with with a doctor. That's fantastic, Mary. Mary, how about this? I have a friend who has a parent. Her her dad has passed away. Her mother is now in her eighties, and her mother still lives in the home where you know her. Um, her dad and her mom lived with all their pretty much all their lives. So now that her mother is getting up there in years, she wants to move her mother closer to her, but they're in two totally different states in the United States. And so what are your suggestions as to how to begin the conversation so that eventually the her mom will be agreeable to moving out of her house, out of her home that she's lived in for decades? into another state and closer to her daughter. What would you say to that, Mary? Yeah, um, actually, we kind of had that happen with my husband's mother, really, um, because it got to the point where she was living in her home that she had been in with her husband, but the taxes became so high that she really could not afford to be there any longer. And I'm telling you, it's not an easy transition uh, your your mother or father or who, whichever parent has left uh, may find it disagreeable. They may say some hurtful things to you, but understand that's coming from a point of fear from them. They are afraid of the unknown. They've already lost a spouse. It's a devastating thing for them. So you need to give them some time. And let's say they lost their spouse 
just within six months or a year, that's not really enough time for a big decision like a move. However, if you see that your parent needs care, it's really important that you begin the discussion with them, but that you also begin this discussion with your spouse and your family. If you decide that you would like to have your parent come live with you, that is a big change because as a lot of people have told me, to have two women in the same household, running the household, so to speak, you're going to have a lot of clash. Um, in my case, it didn't happen because as I said, my mom in love um, was always very gracious with me as well. And, um, but the thing is, is that you have to consider that very heavily because that's gonna change your life and change the amount of time that you can dedicate to either a job you have, your husband, your children, it makes a big impact on everybody. Discuss it amongst yourselves first so that when that loved one, if you are gonna bring them to your home, that you are all in agreement so that that loved one doesn't get in the middle of a big argument. But also start to look around for places and maybe when you uh, bring your mom up, uh, if you can get her to come up to visit for a while, uh, bring her up and uh, take her to a few communities, maybe that you've checked out ahead of time that meet the uh, monetary criteria of your mom's situation. Um, it, was your mom active in playing cards? Maybe she loved bridge. Maybe she was a bowler. Um, maybe she did sewing or crafts or quilting or things like that. Look for a place that has those particular type of activities because that would be something right up her alley. And just take her for a tour. And those facilities, I can tell you a lot of the assisted living um, and, uh, care places are so, they have become so much like social clubs, really. <laughs> I, I think uh, a lot of my dear friends from, from our church family and uh, people we know are in some of these places. And I'm like, man, I want to go live there. It's fun. <laughs> they always have activities going on and they're a beautiful place to live. And uh, so make sure that it's compatible with your loved one's um, tastes and in decor, uh, maybe if your loved one loves nature, you want to pick a place that they can see the trees from. You know, don't make it utilitarian or in, in like they used to call institutions. You know, you really want to get away from that. You want it to feel more like a home, and make sure that it's a place maybe where they can bring a few of their items. Like if they have their own bed or they have their own dressers, you know, that's some of their things around them. And that's going to be the hardest part for them and maybe for you yourself. But um, if you're not the caregiving type, what I would say is start to look for someone that can be the caregiver for your parent. Because I had even told some caregivers for my mother in love when she decided she decided she wanted to go into a care facility assisted living. And she was in that until she had broken her leg and had to go to full care. But there were some uh, nurses and aides working there. I asked them, I said, please, please find another occupation. I just, you, you, if you do not like this job and you don't feel that this was your call to life, please don't do this because it's devastating to the person you're caring for. And I, you, know, you have to be an advocate for your loved one. It's very important. Wow, that is amazing advice. In fact, Diana says, great advice, Mary. Also, <laughs> Patricia says, hi, Mary, you're doing great. Love from Holland. All the way from <laughs> Holland. We have someone in the living <laughs> room. Yeah. 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 Well, we're almost uh, um, out of time. But before we say goodbye, I want to ask you, Mary, um, how do folks contact you? Do you want them to email you? How would you like them to do this? Because I know you have your 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 freemium going to be available in the next week or so. Yeah. So how would you like folks that are viewing the webinar, even on replay, how would you like them to connect with you, Mary? Yes, they could email me. Um, that would be fine. And uh, if it's okay, I'll give them my email address. Is that fine? Yeah, would fine. you Absolutely. want me to type it, Jackie, or do you want to type it in there? Yeah. Where do we yeah. I, I can I can type it in, but in the meantime, some of those who are on replay may not see the chat room completely. They'll see part of it. So if you don't mind saying it out, spelling it out, I'll type it in the chat room. 
Now, of course, we have a very long last name. <laughs> I married that last name. Um, but anyway, it is M underscore Schlumberger. S is in Sam, C is in Charles, H, L, U, M is in Mary, B is in boy, E, R, G is in George, E, R, at yahoo.com. That's the shortest one. <laughs> And I won't give you the business email address because it's huge and much longer. So <laughs> go with that one for now. <laughs> That's wonderful. So folks, look forward. I we look forward to hearing from you. Mary is, is almost done with something that she wants to give to you to bless you. And so please communicate and connect with Mary by going by emailing her again it's m underscore schlumberger at yahoo.com and schlumberger is s-c-h-l-u-m-b-r-g-e-r -E -E m underscore schlumberger at yahoo.com mary do you have any parting thoughts for us before we go well i would just like to say so much uh that i owe the credit to you jackie for making me feel comfortable <laughs> since i am slightly technology challenged <laughs> And that's why the webinar got off to a late start. But uh, I'm hoping for the next webinar to be uh, working pretty smoothly. So, but uh, and to everybody out there, just hang in there. Whether you're approaching uh, senior years or you have a loved one that is, um, it's okay. That's just part of life, and it is truly part of life. Even hospice will tell you that this is part of life. So enjoy your life. And I uh, pray for all of you that you will find something to give you a smile today or a reason to laugh. Thank you. That's it. That's wow. It. Wonderful. Mary, when is the, our next webinar? Can you share with the folks so that they can register, please? Our next webinar will be next Tuesday. Um, that will be April the 20... <laughs> Hold on. I had it on a paper. April 28th. April 28th. 28th. Yep. Yeah. And it's going to be at at April 28th uh, at 2 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. April 28th, 2 o'clock um, Eastern Standard Time. Standard. Standard. Right. Okay. Right. Wonderful. Awesome. Right. And then we will have a third webinar after that. We'll tell you the time on the next one. Um, we'll share with you. We'll share with you when the next webinar is after this coming Tuesday. So, folks. We'll send out the registration link and please, please, please forward the link to other people as well. That way they can gain so much value from what Mary has been sharing and will be sharing in the next two webinars coming up. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We are so honored that you're here. And Mary, I am so honored to be able to be with you on this webinar today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all this Tuesday. Mary? To my family. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, all right, folks. Have a wonderful day. Lord bless you and keep you. And I will say goodbye. Thank you so much. Mary, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.